gas particles spread out. Diffusion also happens when particles dissolved in solution spread out. Here is a drop of ink. It has a high concentration of inkiness. When we drop ink into water, the inky particles spread out. They move from where there's a lot of ink, a high concentration, to where there is less, a low concentration. They move from a high to low concentration. So we say they diffuse down a concentration gradient. The greater the difference between the high and low levels, the faster the spread. When you burn toast, the smell gets round the house because of diffusion. Smoke particles move from the toaster, a high concentration of smoke, to the rest of the house, which generally you'd hope have a low concentration of smokiness. Well, I scraped most of the burnt bits off, and here's the toast going round my gut. Food gets turned into the chemical products of digestion, amino acids, sugars, etc. The concentration of these chemicals in the gut is high, but in the nearby blood capillaries it is low. The desperate for digested toast result the particles move from the gut to the blood by diffusion. Diffusion or wily cunning? No, right, diffusion. Take a deep breath in. Where does the oxygen in the air go? Well, firstly, into the alveolar airspace in the lungs. But where we need it is in the blood. You can breathe out now. How does the oxygen reach the blood circulating through the lungs? It diffuses from a high concentration of oxygen in the airspace across a thin membrane and into the blood where there is a low concentration of oxygen. Without this mechanism you wouldn't last the time it takes for me to explain all this. The thing to remember is that diffusion is movement from high to low concentration and the greater the concentration gradient the faster this takes place. Okay I think you've sussed that Let's look at the other mechanism for moving stuff around. That's called osmosis. For this, we're going to need a partially permeable membrane in two solutions with different concentrations. Before you dash off to get them, you've got loads already in every cell in your body. Each cell wall is a partially permeable membrane. Mmm, sounds attractive. But what is it? It's a barrier that lets some substances through, but not others. In osmosis, the chemical they let through is water. If we put pure water on one side of the membrane and a chemical solution on the other, then you know what's going to happen. The water will diffuse from high to low concentration of water. It goes from the pure water side, which is a high concentration of water, to the other side, where there is a lower concentration of water. This puts water into the chemical solution side, making it more dilute. Works every time. All the while, a small amount of water is flowing back the other way due to random movement of molecules. But most movement is from pure water in the solution, making it weaker. Eventually, the concentrations on both sides of the membrane are the same. Then, there is an equal flow of water in both directions. We have reached equilibrium. Oh, that's better. Now, take a look at my sister's spider plant. Not looking too good, is it? If she'd remembered to water it, then it'd look like this. Water gets into plant root cells by osmosis, and then up into the rest of the plant by more osmosis. This makes the plant's tissues stiff, so they can hold up the leaves. So that's about it. Remember, diffusion takes particles from an area of high concentration to one of low concentration, as in the burnt toast incident. An osmosis takes water through a partially permeable membrane, from a weak solution of dissolved solute to a more concentrated solution, as in plant roots, so long as someone waters them in the first place, obviously. Alright, I think that's a good start, but let's clarify a few things. All right, so in diffusion, molecules or ions move from an area of high concentration to low concentration, but how does this happen and why? And a few other things to clarify. So the molecules are, um, you'll often see a diagram like this, by the way. You'll often see like a uh, 
cartoon sort of like diagram like this um, with little dots representing molecules. Let's say these little pink dots here in the bottom diagram, let's say they're oxygen um, because diffusion of oxygen is uh, critical to get oxygen to all the cells in our body. So let's say we've got little oxygen particles here. Now, when you see a little diagram like this, and whether it's a com uh, com uh, uh, animation or a static drawing, you'll, you'll often see represented that there are a lot of particles on one side and fewer particles on the other side, and that the particles are going to diffuse across the membrane from where there are a lot of them to where there are a few of them. Let's say, let's pretend we had a thousand pink dots on the left and only ten pink dots on the right, and so of course we're going to have uh, a lot of movement of the particles from the left to the right until it's balanced out. Um, but some important things to uh, understand here is that we don't just have movement from left to right and once they balance out, let's say we get to where there's 500 on the left and 500 on the right, it doesn't all just stop. These things never stop moving. So the molecules and the ions, they are constantly in motion and they are constantly in random motion. So we don't just have traffic from where we have lots of them and then the traffic is headed over here to where there are few of them. What we actually have is the little molecules moving around in every single direction randomly. And it just so happens, looks like these are little boy molecules. No, that's just because of the symbol. Alright, so what happens is where you have more of them, and they move around randomly, just by odds, just by random chance, because there are so many more of them, they're going to end up bouncing into each other, hitting each other, and then ricocheting off of each other. They have a bigger chance of doing that. And they also have a bigger chance of going over into the direction of the plasma membrane, and depending on the substance, whether it goes straight on through the phospholipid part or whether it's got to hit right into a protein channel, an integral protein to make its way through. Either way, if there's a thousand particles on the left and only ten particles on the right, we have a much greater chance with the particles moving around randomly that the ones on the left are going to find their way to the right. However, and this is an important however, the molecules on both sides are moving around randomly and some of the ones from the right can go to the left and some of the left can go to the right and so this movement never stops and so when they say they get balanced out um, what it actually is is net equilibrium and so they're basically you know roughly balanced out but there's always going to be some still going from left to right and right to left and they're always bouncing around it's kind of like one of those air lotto machines um, with the balls uh, moving around and if you had uh, let's say we built a little contraption with an air lotto machine on um, two air lotto machines um, next to each other and a kind of a membrane or holes between the two of them. Let's see we're stuck in a little loop here. Alright, there we go. Um, let's take a look at a layer an air lotto machine. Now this isn't exactly like the movement of mar molecules because the movement of molecules is uh, they are self-propelling and with this air lotto machine there's actually you know air blowing it but it's kinda like this and if the little molecules are bouncing around and let's say we had a thousand of them in this machine they would just by odds you know find their way to the little hole to find their way out faster than if we had a machine with let's say only twenty balls in it and so they're not going to find their way out as often all right now if you think about um, that uh, phospholipid bilayer. In the one uh, video we saw, she talked about it like uh, Oreo cookies with the creamy center. 
Or you could think about it like little balls with little tails. And of course we have a fluid mosaic model where because of the chemical structure here and the polar and nonpolar sides, these little phospholipids are going to self-arrange themselves and when they get jostled about, they're going to go back into place. So in our little phospholipid balls with feet, the little balls are the charged or polar side and because they're charged, they are hydrophilic, water-loving, and the little tails, the lipid sides, are hydrophobic or water-hating because they are not charged. So in that, uh, the little lipid tails are our Oreo uh, creamy center of the Oreo cookies. This center core, being non-charged, is hydrophobic. So it's going to kind of have a tendency to push polar molecules away and keep them from crossing over. Now, this is handy um, as part of a selectively permeable membrane, but it also poses a sort of a problem or a, a, a mystery of how do molecules then cross over this hydrophobic core? Well, think about what kind of molecules could maybe cross over and what other structure we have here in this phospholipid bilayer in addition to these phospholipids. Well, think back to the lab, the video with the bubbles. What let the pencil go through the bubbles uh, without breaking or popping the bubble? Well, one of the methods is uh, for substances that were lipid soluble. So if you take the pencil and you roll it around in the soap solution, or remember she talked about the kids putting their hands in the bubbles, and then once they're covered, they can actually get their whole hand through the bubbles. Whee! So if it's covered in lipids, it's lipid soluble, then those substances can go right through. They can become basically like contiguous uh, or become one with the bubble solution and make their way through. Little particles, little molecules, little ions, uh, some of them are small enough to pass right through the um, phospholipid uh, 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 area or through the membrane channels, um, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. And sometimes they are assisted by carrier molecules um, that specifically uh, link uh, like a lock and key to specific molecules. And we'll take a closer look at how that works specifically. But think about some of the processes that you know about, maybe in the video, a uh, critical process that we have to do all day long that requires diffusion happening, happening at a rather rapid uh, rate. Well, let's think about breathing. So we have to get oxygen into every cell of our bodies. How does this happen so quickly? Well, because, you know, these are just molecules bouncing around. And every cell in your body needs to get oxygen. Well, fortunately, the plasma membrane is very, very thin. In fact, it's only about as um, one one thousandth the thickness of a piece of paper. So the distance that they uh, have to travel is very short. And this is this is critical for getting oxygen into the cells. And uh, one of my favorite uh, anatomy podcast lecturers, um, I learned something really fascinating from him. His name is Dr. Gerald Cisadlo. And uh, he's kind of got like this Garrison Keeler kind of voice and um, just brilliant at explaining the physiology. Um, you can look him up and uh, listen to his uh, Anatomy and Physiology podcast. But um, anyway, one thing fascinating I learned from him is how close every cell in the body has to be to the capillaries to get oxygen or they'll die. How close do you think cells have to be to 